So let's continue this charging for diagnostic time since I've created um, a bunch of noise here and we got a lot of feedback, a lot of negative feedback uh, from people saying you shouldn't be charging a customer to research the car, um, things like that. I think really that's what I want to address here. I'm going to pull a segment out of my newest um, video that I've done on my website. Uh, if you guys want to see the full case study, you're going to have to do it there. This is not going to be available on YouTube, but I'm pulling this segment out because I want you guys to see the type of research I'm talking about. This Jeep had a new engine computer and a new alternator, and this thing still had problems. Are you going to need another five, six, seven hundred dollar computer? It could be a two thousand dollar computer. Are you two thousand dollars confident that I need another computer? The alternator itself, that's an easier call, 150, 200 bucks for an alternator maybe, but still, are you $200 confident? Guys, that's what this is about. Being confident in your call, especially, especially when it's new parts that are already in there, and especially when it comes to a faulty module. You have to check everything. You have to make sure you're not missing anything, and we're not guessing on it. Up, upwards of two thousand dollar module that's not what this is about a true diagnostic technician should be paid for his time this is what it looks like okay so i'm i'm thinking in my head right now do i do we talk about the flow chart i think the i think we should probably at this point to address the questions that i just raised let's look at the flow chart the p063a i believe is the code so this this portion we're, we're learning Description, operation of this GenSense Gen control circuit, and then the flow chart itself. That's the plan. I want to plug in what the computer is actually doing, and then the the follow up to that is going to be I'm going to substitute a Gen voltage on this circuit and make that light go away, proving the alternator is at fault and that the engine computer is fine. That's the path we're on. Stay with me. I promise you, this will be cool. Um, this part here might be a little bit dry because it's description, operation, how does this thing work? Okay, research, key. All right, let's go. On gasoline powered engines, the charging system's turned on and off with the PCM, right? We know that, that's our generator control, we just watched that. And ignition switch with the engine running. The field circuit will not be energized until the engine's running and ignition is on, which we saw too when I did my test light tests. This voltage is connected through the PCM and supplied to one of the generator field terminals, the Gen Source B Plus at the back of the alternator. The generator is internally grounded, information that we could have used early on. Generator's internally grounded What's that mean? Power side switched. Okay, good. Generator regulates the field using a pin one of the field connector. So pin one, top wire of this connector, and it says it's a high side driver. Ah, great information. I think we read that to you guys before. The PCM or ECM receives a voltage input from the generator, and that would be our GenSense circuit that I'm connected to right now, which is the bottom wire, right? The PCM or ECM receives a voltage input from the generator, now they're giving us numbers here, and I didn't pay attention to this yesterday, so focus on this picture. Follow me while I'm reading this, okay? The PCM or ECM receives a voltage input from the generator, and also battery voltage input seven from the TIPM. It then compares voltages to the desired voltage programmed in the EVR, electronic voltage regulator software, which is in the computer. And if there's a difference, it sends a signal to the generator EVR circuit to increase or decrease output. That's the duty cycle control, to increase or decrease duty cycle. It's a pulse width modulated signal. There's our two words that get interchanged all the time, duty cycle pulse width to send signals to the generator circuitry to control the amount of output from the generator, the amount of DC current produced, by the generator is controlled by the EVR. Again, that's inside of the engine computer and alternator itself, right? There's no external voltage regulator. Right. Remember that picture you were looking at yesterday, Danner? That I was like, oh, right, keep going. That was important. We're about to share this with everyone else, so might as well do it with you right now, is they give a description of this whole thing. This is your PCM, one's the PCM, two's the TIPM, four is the generator, three is the battery, okay? Mm -hmm. We'd have 14 at the battery, right mm -hmm. coming over to the gen what they show um the sense the main battery lug would be the 14 as yes well. so internally i see that loop and internally that's that we're attached 
to the main battery lug, right? So I guess for you guys and for my brother, why is my scan tool showing me 14 volts and 14 volts on the, it says 14 on the gen sense, on the voltage sense. Yeah. And it says 14 is desired and it's good. Why is it happy? The reason it's happy is the tipums here. The tipum gets that battery voltage and sends that signal to the ECM. That's where it's coming from. This circuit that's tied in to the battery lug, which is my Gen Sense wire. They show this as a dotted line right there, right? See the dotted line? You would think by looking at this that that would be feeding in that 14 volts up here to the engine computer. And that's what I'm thinking too, right? Gen Sense circuit, it's, it's tied into the lug of battery, the battery post, and it should be feeding up there. And remember, that's the wire. Number five is the wire that we're reading 0.73 of a volt on, okay? Let's keep going. Voltage is monitored at the B plus terminal stud. That's what I was just talking about right there, right? The B plus terminal stud. Voltage is monitored at the B plus terminal stud to ensure it is connected. If the B plus cable is loose, the PCM will shut down the generator field because of this new feature. Two, pin two of the field connector is internally connected to the B plus terminal. That statement right there, should tell us that the Gen Sense circuit should have battery voltage on it. That's the way I read that. Moving on. This is wrong. I wrote wrong. <laughs> this is further into the operation. And this is crazy. This is leftover. If you guys remember when I started this process, I'm like, oh, this is a ground side switch driver. I've done a ton of these. And they used to be. And unfortunately, Chrysler took that information of their older systems that are ground side switched and they put it in this one that's power side switched, even within its own um description operation from the manufacturer they got it wrong look what it says voltage is regulated by cycling the ground path to control the strength of the rotor field <laughs> go ahead bullshit <laughs> <laughs> the evr circuitry monitors system line voltage battery positive temperature and then determines target voltage if sensed battery voltage is 0.5 or lower the pcm grounds the field winding until sensed battery voltage is 0.5 or higher you, you hear what I'm reading right here? I did, it's all opposite. That's wrong, uh, but that's how they used to work. Like it's leftover Info. information. As, as you're learning, don't forget that wrong information happens. Even within flowcharts, our Gen Sense wiring diagram doesn't show the internal connected to battery post. Gen Sense at the PCM. All right, this is the flow chart for this. Set conditions, this says 1100 RPM, but it's right away. PCM recognizes the alternator output voltage is less than battery feed voltage is when it sets this code, this Gen Sense code. But when we look at the freaking scan tool, it's good. Voltage is good, why? Because it's coming from the tip -um. So computer doesn't like this circuit. Again, we're thinking battery voltage here. It's not gonna be battery voltage. This dotted line that they're showing us right here, inside of there, is some type of resistor, some type of dropping resistor. There's a certain voltage on that circuit that the computer's looking at, and it's not battery voltage. I'll prove it to you. This is how we're gonna call this alternator as being bad again. All right, now, wait do you see what we have to deal with with the flow chart? How, how would you be able to make this call? If this car came into you without any of this history, this is what you'd do. You'd follow this flow chart, how it's read. Our possible causes, excessive resistance in the gen send circuit. We've already addressed that, haven't we? Generator send circuit shorted to ground. Nope, it's not either one of those. Generator itself or PCM, it's one of the two. That's where we are with this code because we already checked the wiring opens and shorts. So in the flow chart, it has you start with, is it an active code? Clear it, check it, does it reset? Yes, it does. Keep going, we start step two, excessive resistance in the generator sense circuit. So what do you do? You disconnect the alternator, disconnect the computer, check that circuit for excessive resistance. Continue on the flow chart. It um, has you, after you verify that you don't have a resistance problem, if it's good, you go to step three. We know we're good. Step three, check it for a short to ground, the gen sense for a short to ground. And we did that as well. If it's shorted, repair the short. If it's not, go to four, we check the gen sense. The next thing they want you to do is what I showed when we started, which is the test light to battery positive, and then start the car and make sure the test light lights. 
if the test light lights, is the generator control circuit working? That's what they have you doing in this next part. And it describes it, does the test light illuminate accordingly? If it does not, we go to step five and we're replacing the PCM, right? Connectors, look for broken pins, blah, 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 right? Which we replaced the PCM before. It wasn't working properly. But if it, it's good, look what they have you do. Does the test light illuminate accordingly? Yes, verify that there's good pin terminal contact in the generator and PCM module connectors. If okay, what are we doing? Replace the generator. What? That's our flow chart for our P063A with no indication of what the voltage level should be on that circuit. The only thing they tell us is that circuit's connected to the BAT post of the alternator. It came on at nine volts. Okay. That's our threshold between, it should be between nine and 11 volts. All right, PJ would like that too. PJ, you got a second. So Chrysler, in their infinite wisdom, they put this, that's the tip them. That's your battery. So you get inputs, go to the tip them, feed the PCM, number one's the PCM. So when you're looking at voltage sense on the PCM, it's coming from the tip them, not from the generator sense circuit. The generator send circuit is described as being fed to the BAT post internal and then feeds back into the PCM this way. That's your gen sense. All the description, everything they show you, it says it's attached to battery voltage. They don't give you any voltage readings for what the gen sense circuit should be. The gen sense circuit should be between nine and 11 volts. How do I know that? I dialed in a potentiometer with my test light between nine and 11 and I can make that gen sense code go away. It's not battery voltage. The point is that is a mother effing resistor that's in oh, there man. that they're not telling you about. That sensing circuit on the PCM that's reading 14 volts, you'd think it'd be coming from there. It's not, and that's a resistor that's in there. So you said that should be between nine and 11. Yep. At what voltage does it shut the light off? At, at? Uh, between nine and 11, the light stays off. Below okay. nine, it sets the P063A okay. gen sense circuit. Above 11, it sets a voltage to high code. The gen sense circuit goes away code. That will really And now it, set, it sets a voltage high code. Right, at 11 yeah, volts, at 11 it sets volts. a voltage high code. Exactly. So there's an algorithm in that program that says yep. it monitors between that nine and 11 volts, but they don't give you that information. That information is not on the scan data either. So is this kind of like a voltage divider circuit? Uh, it must be, yeah. yeah there has it to has be, to be. to be at 11 yeah. volts. Yeah, and, and so they're taking direct battery voltage, like I said, right there, and then they're feeding that into the gen sense but that's a resistor because it's not battery voltage. Yeah. And like, just like you said, voltage divider. So yes, you'd have, you'd have one resistor here and then you'd have another, another resistor monitor. here and we're gonna monitor this guy where at, in front of that resistor. Yep. And this is one where the ECM was replaced because the field circuit was shorted to ground all the time. Yeah. And I had a Gen Sense fault too, but you don't address that. Exactly. You, you address the shorted driver. And that's, that's relatively common, common right so we yeah. get this ecm back and i have an egr code that i didn't have before and a gen sense fault so what's my first thought uh, just send it back it's just a faulty ecm and then my brother's like man we got to be sure and i'm like well how can i manipulate this gen sense circuit yeah. to make it work and, and that's, i like it that's what i, that's what I, I like it. That's what I, I thought you'd like that one so that was a good review with pj for you guys and what we just did and why and I hope that makes sense. Uh, I don't have the information as PJ and I were talking, like that's a voltage divider circuit. It is. That Gen Sense circuit cannot be battery voltage. It cannot be. Below nine volts, we set the Gen Sense circuit fault, the P063A. Above 11 volts, it sets too high a voltage code. This is a faulty alternator. This is a faulty Gen Sense circuit in the alternator. Yes, we have a new ECM. Yes, the alternator is being controlled now. Yes, we have a faulty EGR solenoid code that is because the ECM is still bad. But we've found the alternator, that piece that was replaced, not a good piece, still have a problem in this alternator. No more battery light, alternators charging, but they need another ECM for the EGR fault. It does not function. Caleb was asking me about that on the way here. It doesn't function at all. Driver does not function. Um, 
it doesn't work, EGR will never open. Uh, but at least the customer can drive it for now and they can handle that later at another time. These kind of things are difficult for us in the field. How do we bill for them? I gotta tell you guys again, you bill for your time. Like this is, there's no reason why we should be working on this car for free because it has another bad ECM and you have to do all those checks to make sure it is a bad ECM again. No way we should eat that, no way. Charge for your time. Your time is worth it. Guys, thanks so much. See you next time. So I hope that clarifies things. I know that most of that um, was probably talking over your head, especially if you're the customer. Um, but does it sound like the type of research I'm talking about and on the job training that I'm talking about is that I don't know what I'm talking about? Or is it possible that the cars we work on are so complex and that even the same car one year later does something completely different than it did the year before. And that's one car, one car line, one circuit. Every car is different. You work in the aftermarket, we work on 40 different car lines. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different models that every year can be something different. We can't possibly know this stuff off the top of our head. That's the research and on-the-job training that I'm talking about. It's legit. It isn't the customer paying for our education. Like Those comments just show the ignorance that is in this field on what it takes to do this stuff. You cannot, I've said this so many times, you cannot hook up a scan tool to a car and get a trouble code and then change a part based on that code. Sure, you can. You can get away with it sometimes. What? 50% of the time, maybe? So what's a 50 on a test in high school? Do you remember? Yeah, it's an F. It's an F. That's not good enough. You need to be upper 90s, 98, 99%. Anybody that tells you that are 100% is lying to you. This field has so many variables, things that can be missed, even by the most careful technician. Again, I'm talking about legit research here, guys. That was legit. I showed you that. I know it was complex. But within that, I also showed that the service information was wrong. So we have to deal with that too. Bad new parts. A bad new ECM. It was a reman. A bad new alternator. I think it was a reman too. And making the call and telling the customer, again, I'm sorry, Mr. Customer, these parts are bad. <laughs> yeah. Research time. Takes time. We should be paid for that time. That's all I'm saying. The customers that have been through the ringer with some of these parts changing methods understand what I'm talking about. And that you want to find technicians like us that do proper troubleshooting. And the thing about that is we need to be paid for that. We shouldn't want to go grab a brake job or a state inspection because it pays us more than a job like this. This is a problem car that's been to multiple places and is now fixed. We should be compensated for that. And uh, yeah, I make no apologies for that. Just trying to clarify to the customers here what I'm talking about, what kind of research and also to the technicians that might be new out there. You can't just bill all these hours for things you have no idea what you're doing, right? I have 30 years in this field, 30 years, and I'm still learning every day. And I should be paid for that time. Our technicians should be paid for that time. To be clear too with what we do with the camera, I don't charge at all anymore. Diagnostic time and Billing and all of that stuff is irrelevant to me because you guys pay me by watching the videos. You guys pay me by joining my website and watching the videos over there and the classes over there. That's how I get paid today. So when I do these case studies, I make sure I'm very, very thorough. But you hear me talking about how to bill because my clientele is technicians. That's who I'm teaching to. I'm teaching them how to bill properly so we can fix your cars right the first time, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, and so we're not parts changers. Don't be a parts changer.